All right, everybody, <clears throat> welcome to the channel. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon and the Blackest Heart, both books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today, we're going to be reviewing Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. So, this came out in 1991. Um, we always review the covers first. Let's do it. The cover, good. I mean, what, what more can you say? It is what it is. I mean, the, my hardcover looks the same as my paperback. And in fact, I got to give a shout out to the publisher because I got every Outlander book in hardcover right there. You can see, and then my other, uh, there's a few more over there. You can see all the covers and spines match. They've all got a similar theme. And then I even have the paperback versions here. And they all look nice together. Plus, not only that, I've got every single Outlander book on audible.com. And I listened to this on Audible over a period of about a week. And I was charmed by it. Quite a bit more. Okay, so this is my history with this book. I knew about this book when it came out in 1991. It was a big release, but it was in the romance section. It stayed in the romance section for a good 10 years. Same with like the two or three sequels that followed it in the 90s. They were just listed as romance books. So I never even, I was aware of them and aware that they were big sellers. I just didn't give a fuck about them because they were in a romance section. And why, why, why the hell would I look at that? Well, about 2001, maybe around 1999 or 2000, 2001, they shifted these books from romance section in every bookstore to just the regular fiction section, which was the right move, the absolute right move, because these are not romance novels at all. Still, though, I was skeptical. But then I had a girlfriend at the time who loved these books. She's like, dude, you've got to read them. You love Ken Follett. You love Pillars of the Earth. You love Game of Thrones. You love all these fantasy books. Outlander is can compete with every bit of every one of those books. And so I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. So about the two, year 2000, 2001, I read the first Outlander book, and I was like, at the time, I was like, okay, that was really super well written, but I don't know if it's the story for me. I just don't know. And she's like, well, give the series a chance. And so well, then I picked up the next book in the series, which was Dragonfly and Amber. And it was that book that blew me away. I was like, okay, th these books are dope. These books are dope. Now I'm hooked. Now I'm hooked. So this is the second time I've read it. Like I said, my first time I was a little kind of like neutral on it. What did I think now? I just, I loved every minute of it. Listening to this again on Audible, I absolutely adored and was enchanted by every single fucking word in this book, and I don't know why, other than maybe it's because in... I'm familiar with the Scottish Highlands now, unlike I was familiar with them when I first read it. Like, in between my first reading and this reading, I actually have visited Scotland, and I have driven through the Highlands, and I've spent a lot of time there in a lot of the places that are mentioned, so I know exactly kind of the feeling of the landscape and what the landscape looks like. In fact, if you don't believe me, my actual author photo is of me at Eileen Donnan Castle, which is in the Scottish Highlands, just north of Fort William and a few other places. And everything, everything is mentioned in these books. So, uh, Knowing the landscape, knowing what the landscape is like, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like, what it feels like, what the wind is like, what the trees are like and the rocks are like, and all of the castles. Having been to these places, I'm like, now I am like super enchanted by this book with the reread. So what is it about? Well, let's talk about it. It starts in 1945 in Inverness, Scotland, with Claire Randall, who is a World War II nurse. World War II has just ended. She is going on like a second honeymoon with her husband into the Scottish Highlands because her husband wants to do some genealogy work up there. And it's just a cool place to go on a second honeymoon. And, and I can attest to that. 
It's just a cool place to go. Not that I've ever been on a second honeymoon. I have not. But I've been to the Scottish Highlands. And so once we get there, they start to do their research. Some mysteries start to crop up within their lives and within her husband's Frank Randall. And within his, he's, he's one of the people he's researching in his genealogy is Black Jack Randall, who was an English soldier and nobleman back in the day when the Scottish were fighting when, during the Jacobite Rising when the Scottish were fighting the um, uh, English. And there was a lot of conflict. And he starts to find out that there was some bad and evil things about his ancestry. Not only that, but just in their own life, there's some crazy weird stuff going on, like every porch that they see in 1945 Inverness has blood splattered on it. And um, there's kind of a guy, there's like a ghost in a kilt that sort of haunts them. And then there's... Um, a palm reader that reads Claire's palm and gives her some cryptic information. And uh, all of this stuff, all of these mysteries, I, this, that was in the first 50 or so uh, pages. And I was just like, I was into it. I was so into it. I was just like, there is magic in these pages. And I didn't see it the first time I read it. But I'm seeing it now, and I was just so looking forward to everything else that was going to come. And so then what happens is there's these standing stones... I have been to many stone circles in Wales, Scotland, and England, and I'm telling you they're magical places. I love everything about them. I just feel like I'm touching those stones, and history is just like, I mean, it's just like history is just at my fingertips. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, the stone circle comes, and she goes to the stone circle because she's into herbology, and she wants to pick some flowers out of the stone circle that she saw. She touches the, one of the stones and is whisked off, magically whisked out of 1945 and into the mid-1700s, and that's where the adventure starts. Now she is trying to figure out where the hell am I. She wakes up. She's like still in the standing stone circle and she wakes up. And if you're familiar with the story, you know, you know where it goes. She wakes up. She's like, she doesn't know where she's at. She sees these Englishmen and some Scottishmen with uh, rifles firing at each other and chasing each other through the woods. She just immediately thinks like, oh, I've, I've stumbled into a movie set and uh, maybe I should just get myself out of here because I don't want to interrupt the movie. And so she sort of does this, but then one of the Englishmen chases her, blah, blah, blah. She finds out this is real. This this isn't a movie set. These guys really are like fighting each other and wanting to kill each other. And she ends up in the hands of some Scottish rogues, um, you know. And uh, one of those rogues is a guy named Jamie. And he, Jamie McKenzie and, or McTavish or whatever you want to call him. And he is um, injured. Oh, shit. What the fuck? I just threw the book on the floor. Let's, we'll put this one up here because it's less likely to be. Th this one is less likely to be thrown about. Um, so, Jamie McTavish or Jamie is injured. She's a nurse from so she, uh, she reluctantly the Scottish rogues let her work on Jamie's injuries. They find out that she's a wonderful healer. They take her back to their castle. the The lord of the castle is um, and. You know, first of all, they all think that she's an English spy because she speaks with an English accent and her name is English. Uh, she tells them her, her real name is Claire Beecham rather than Randall, uh, probably because they know that Jack, they know she doesn't want to say Randall because Black Jack Randall is their enemy, the Scottish's enemy. And so they, she don't want to say that. So she said Beecham. So that, but they're still, they still think she's a spy. So they kind of keep her captive. But as she's kept captive in this castle village, she starts to really like people and she becomes a, the sort of the castle sort of cleric healer, not cleric. But healer, um, I'm thinking of Dungeons and Dragons where the clerics are the healers, but you know what I'm talking about. She's just like the healer. And uh, they, she becomes a very well-respected person in the short time that she's there, also falling in love with the roguish Jamie who's got a secret history of his own, which we won't go into here. I don't want to give too many spoilers because I've already spoiled about the first 150 pages of this book. Um, but anyway, she star as she lives with these people, she starts to understand that the English weren't always 
the noble people that they were uh, that they purport themselves to be. She already knew that Black Jack Randall was sort of a bad guy because of her husband um, researching it in 1945. Not only that, but this Black Jack Randall fellow, she meets him in real life in this book, and he looks exactly like her husband. So she's that's another issue. And then um, the Jacobite Rising, she knows that's in the near future of these Scottish rogues. And she knows that the, that those wars go poorly for the Scottish. And she's trying desperately to warn them, uh, stop trying to be rebels because it's just going to end in a shit show for all of you. Because I, And they're like, how do you know? She's like, I know. I'm like, how do you know? Well, I just know. And they're like, well, how do you know? They, they, they just don't trust her or anything she says because she's walking this fine line of, do I tell them I'm from the future? Well, that's going to make me look like a witch and they'll probably burn me at the stake. Or do I just give them hints of the mistakes they're making so they can correct it and not die in the end of this book? Uh, it's, it's a very interesting, very push-pull. Uh, not only that, um, now there are romantic scenes. Many, 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 uh, you know. And I'm now just starting to watch the uh, TV show that they made of Outlander. And it's actually the TV show's following the book fairly closely so far. Book one, at least. And, you know, there's a lot of very good-looking people that get naked on the show. Not to say that that's the only reason you should watch it, but it is, you know, I, I, I'm no prude here, folks. I'm no prude. I'm, I'm not judging anybody. Um, I'm just saying that... Um, there are some sex scenes in this. And I think that's why it was originally put in the romance section of the bookstores for the first 10 years of its existence. And I think that's why a lot of dudes never read it and still don't read it is because it is just sort of lumped in that romance category. It is not a romance. It is a great historical adventure novel. Not only that, but the sequels even get way fucking better. Like all of these sequels up here, get way, way better, and, um, you know, book number, uh, let's see, what are we at, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think book number nine is coming out later this month, and so we'll, uh, you know, probably read that and review it, anyway, I, I give, uh, you know, when I, if, when I read this back in the year 2000, and I had a lukewarm response to it, I probably would have given it a five or six out of ten. It was just good enough that it piqued my interest to read the next book in the series, which really got me going. Um, Rereading it, though, oh my gosh. It's like, it's like that NFL player that, that wins Comeback Player of the Year. This book wins Comeback Book of the Year because it's like two, in the year 2000 when I read it, I was just like, eh. Now I read it and I was like, this is a fucking 10 out of 10. It's a straight 10 out of 10 book. That's how much I enjoyed the second go-around of Outlander by Dano Gabaldon. Done.